For centuries, us humans across many cultures believed that our surrounding walls have ears. Silently, they listen as we sleep, calmly eavesdropping our most intimate conversations. Now, we all know that is just a proverb and does not reflect actual reality. But for one family, it did. For months, a single father attributed the walls of horror to his daughter's runaway imaginations. Something sinister lurks behind our walls, his daughter would say. He never believed, that is, until those listening walls started to speak. Welcome back to this episode of Talk Murder to Me. Um, so our drink is called a fire and blood. Straight rum. With, yeah, what the hell? That's way too strong. Ugh. Well, it's rum with a dash of grenadine, I believe. And the glass is washed with gin. Why don't you just wash it with water and soap? Because that's not <laughs> what it says. Uh, we, we have a shortage of both water and soap now that the, we're in this pandemic. That's correct. <laughs> Save it for... Ness- uh, well, alcohol works just as well for cleaning. Surprise shots, surprise shots. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. That tasted like red wine vinegar. Oh, that was gross. Gross. But we did finish a bottle of something. This was a uh, sweet and dry vermouth. I want to start this episode out by showing you a news clipping that I happened to just run into while doing this story. And About the story? No, it has nothing to do with this story, but it was right beside one of the news clippings that I pulled for this story. It was right to the right of it. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. So tonight we're going to Massachusetts. And this is what came up. If you want to read this, Nicole, this is from the Boston Globe, Wednesday, October 12th, 1988. Youth sentenced to three-month term in racial attack. A 17-year-old Dorchester youth was sentenced to serve three months in Suffolk County House of Corrections yesterday after admitting that he violated a 1986 civil rights injunction by participating in a racially motivated attack on two Vietnamese men this spring. Mark Wahlberg of Marky Mark. Pervall Street was ordered by Judge Robert A. Mulligan to serve three months of a two-year sentence after Wahlberg pleaded guilty in Suffolk Superior Court to two counts of criminal contempt. The remainder of the sentence was suspended for two years. The contempt complaint filed by the state's attorney general's office charged that Wahlberg struck Than Pham Lam of Dorchester on the head of April 8th with a five-foot wooden pole. Minutes later, Wahlberg walked up to a Dorchester resident, Ho Trin, several blocks away and punched him in the eye, according to the complaint. A judge issued a continuing civil rights injunction against Wahlberg two years earlier after the youth was connected with physical and verbal attacks on black elementary school children in Dorchester. So that's your Marky Mark up there. And I uh, saw in 2017, I believe, he tried to get a pardon for Hmm. these racial attacks, but it was turned down. And people were kind of mad about that. He's actually like really he really is back into his faith now. He's like one of the most famous Hmm. Catholic people. Really? Other than like the Pope, you know. (laughs) Yeah, but he's still a racist, (laughs) apparently. You know, Southie's a rough town. You can't be. My dad's from Dorchester. You can't be hitting Vietnamese. Yeah, so uh, yeah, he's a racist. Can you read this? This is from the headline of The Republic, 3rd December 1987. Massachusetts Hamlet, stunned by triple slang. Is it, have you guys heard of this case by any chance? Uh, right off the bat, no, I don't know what this is referring to. Although the word Hamlet always used to make me think of the word omelet, and now I would like an omelet. Well, IHOP is open. <laughs> this is true. This time I did get a uh, free delivery and $5 off coupon. Oh, The triple slang is this family right here. It's a very sad case, oh. actually. Tuesday, December 1st, 1987, 3 Saunders Road, Townsend, Massachusetts. You guys know where that is? Yeah, that's a that's outside. Uh, isn't that out? Is it? No, I don't really know where it is. Do you know where Pepper Rail is? Mm-mm. Okay. Might, I would g- assume it's out western Mass yeah, I because I don't west, know where it is. Yeah, it is. is. Um, um, I was like, like I know it, where Townsend, Maryland is. But is it? No. Is it near uh, Haverhill? I don't know. I, I would just assume it's western because I don't know where it is. 
Okay, so go to talkmore.com to see the victim profiles and everything else. Who you're looking at right there, that's Priscilla Gustafson. She's 33, and that's her two children, Abigail, seven, and William, five. Mm. Now, here's what happened on this Tuesday, December 1st, 1987. The husband comes home. He is an attorney. He works at this law firm. He drives up to the driveway at 5.20 p.m., Little does he know the entire family's inside the two-story Cape Cod-type home, mm. completely dead. Priscilla Gustafsson had been shot to death and was found inside a second-floor bedroom of the two-story Cape Cod-style home. Authorities said that they believe the two children who were found in separate bathtubs had been drowned. Mm. Okay, so Priscilla Gustafsson, 33 years old, she died of two gunshot wounds to the head. Okay, she was laying face down with a pillow over her head. She was sexually assaulted. Okay, this is most likely prior to death. She was also severely beaten. She was shot twice in the head with the pillowcase on her head. Not only that, the mother was also pregnant. She was in the very early stages of her pregnancy when this happened. So basically, he killed killled four people. She also suffered from blunt trauma to the head and compression Of the neck. Now, a little bit about Priscilla. She was the church nursery school teacher. She was also the daughter of two reverends, Reverend William Morgan and Reverend Jeanne Morgan. They they were both former pastors of the first congregational church on Main Street. She was also in the course and everything else. This was a Christian woman. The whole family was Christian. Her daughter, Abigail Seven, she's a second grader. She was found drowned in a shallow bathtub in the home. In a separate bathtub with another shallow level of water was her son, William, five years old, also drowned. So it's a triple slang entire family. Wow. The husband walks in from a normal day at work and finds this. Okay. And it wasn't the husband. So I'll rule that out for you right now. I mean, uh, because I want you guys to understand how tragic that is to walk in and see not only your wife, but your seven-year-old and your five-year-old dead. That's like awful. Yeah. So it's it, very interesting that the killer then, whoever it is, sh- has two different murder like types in one case. What and do you like mean? W- he drowns the kids yet shoots the wife. Well, well, maybe, maybe they didn't want to shoot the kids. You know, maybe they just wanted to drown drown the kids, or or maybe the he forced the mother to drown the kids. I'll skip forward right quick and go over the timeline right quick so you guys okay. can understand it. Now, the police think the slaying occurred between 3.30 and 5.20 p.m. One witness says that they saw Priscilla at 1 p.m. that day. She returns home from the babysitter picking up her son, William. The police believe that Priscilla and her son were killed first in the home. Now, Abigail didn't get home to 3.30 p.m. because she was walking home from the school bus. She's in second grade. So the killer was in the house, most likely, at the time, and forced Priscilla on the bed, put the pillowcase over her head, and eventually shot her Mm -hmm. twice after he raped her. And then he drowns William and then waits for Abigail to come home at 3.30. She walks in, and then he drowns her, too. I mean, if you think about the time that it takes to drown someone, like you got to get the bath water running, enough water. Well, it was a very shallow. I mean, there's no pictures, obviously, thank God, but there's a very shallow. I know, but you'd think like, okay, if they've got a gun and your intent is to kill. Plus is a five-year-old. Yeah, that that makes sense as to why he would kill the mother first. I know, I get that, but like, why wouldn't you shoot them? Like, if you have a he gun... He did. He shot the mother twice in the head. I know, but why would you not shoot the child? Why would you drown the child? I mean, it's a child. He's not going to... Like, I get that a child's not going to struggle, but, like, okay, if you've already got a gun and you want to take, like, shoot somebody quickly, that's a very... Chill, killing a child in that way seems very, like, personal. Yeah. Drown, like, that takes time. You have to look at the child. Like, you know, we've covered some, tra- like, child murders before, and... I just think that it's strange that it's two different methods of killing. Well, no one knows this for sure, but maybe... Maybe I'm looking too much into it. They weren't all dead, and then Abigail gets home. I don't know if that helps you out at all. And then he kills all three. No no one knows, because he said he was innocent. But he's obviously guilty. 
Jesus so, must not be named yet. Now, this is going to be very important because of this case. I mean, there are other triple homicides and everything. So, you know, what makes this one stick out and kind of grab my attention? The police suggested evidence of a, quote, ritualistic killing. Mm. OK, so I'm going to go back to that later. Mm-hmm. But just think about that. Okay, ritualistic. And this, this is, is during the time of the Satanic Panic. Yes. This is, so th- our this theories may be working. 1987 actually is when this happened. So this is in the time frame. So that the cops were auto- automatically thinking this has got to be some sort of cult thing or whatever. We're asking people to think back about the events of Tuesday afternoon and comb their memories for anything remotely suspicious they may have seen, said Middlesex County District Attorney Scott Harshberger during a news conference at the town hall Wednesday morning. Before we go any further, I want to kind of go over the victim background from what I can find in the newspapers. So the neighbors described the family as, quote, pillars of the community. They're active in the Townsend Congressional Church and the town's Couples Club, which is like a social charity organization. And one neighbor said this about the entire family. This is from the Boston Globe, 3rd of December, 1987. They were a very happy, very close family, said a relative who asked not to be identified. The relative who lives in upstate New York, she said she had seen the Gustafsons in May when they had vacationed at her home. They were very excited about the couple's club and said that they had made many good friends, said the relative in a telephone interview. It seemed that they had found a niche and they were well adjusted. This is stunning. Neil Lund, minister of the Congregational Church, said they weren't your average nice people. They were role models. That's what makes this so hard. So it's a very tragic case. Now, who do you think the killer is? Like, who would do this and why would he do this? Was this a random kind of robbery or what? What do you guys think? No. This one actually kind of reminds me of the leaf killer. Remember oh. how he like went to the that family's house? And he ended up killing the kids yeah. as well. That one was random, but he s- chose them. Like, he didn't know them personally before. Yeah. So maybe he just, whoever killed them, for whatever reason, targeted them. I don't know. I don't know. Something in my gut is saying that it was that pastor that we just quoted. What? Ooh. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Things took a turn. I was about to do a Catholic murder today, too. There's like this pope. Not pope, but like one of the... Cardinal? I don't know. Whatever. Archbishop? Bishop? Priest? I don't know. One of the minions. Someone. This is from the Boston Globe. The headline is, Suspect in Slangs is Captured. How old do you think this kid is? Oh, you gave something away. You gave something away. (laughs) Go ahead and read this. I was going to say 22. Go ahead and read that, Nequeezers. Daniel J. LaPlante. Very close to my last name. Awkward. Daniel J. LaPlante, the 17-year-old Townsend youth who allegedly murdered a mother and her two children in the Townsend home, was captured last night as he hid under a dumpster outside a lumberyard in Ayer. LaPlante's arrest shortly after 6.30 p.m. ended one of the state's most intense manhunts in recent history. So this is a two-day manhunt. Now, after the first day, literally within 12 hours, they knew who did this. Oh, well, he must Everyone knew who did this. Well, he's young and amateur, you know, clearly doesn't watch forensic files. Well, yeah, but I'm going to show you why in a minute. Is he responsible for watching the kids? Oh no, he's not. No, you wouldn't trust this guy to watch your. Okay, because I wouldn't was, trust this guy to watch my pet turtle. That was my th- my theory before <laughs> before you said that kid um, was that maybe it was like the babysitter. The babysitter? Mm. No, that's a good theory, but I wouldn't. I mean, as soon as you hear about this guy, you wouldn't trust him to watch your pet viper <laughs> or whatever. Oh no, the uh, Who Boston owns a snake. The Boston Globe quotes a couple hours after Danny Laplante, which I'll call him Danny from now on is alleged to have used his hands. So there's a few hours after he kills the mother and then drowns the two kids in separate bathtubs. A few hours later, quote, a couple hours after Danny LaPlante is alleged to have used his hands to snuff the life out of a seven-year-old Abigail Gustafson, he used those same hands to tickle his six-year-old niece at her birthday party. That's a sick fuck. (laughs) Yeah, that is a really sick fuck. So you wouldn't want this guy babysitting at all. No. I mean, this guy is fucked. 
I'll tell you that right now. This case gets fucked real quick. <laughs> so. Excellent. <laughs> All right, go ahead and read this, Jen. By 5 o'clock last night, the search had co concentrated on an area surrounding the Moore Lumberyard and Air, where the plant had been traced after a registry of motor vehicles. Police officers saw him in a van that had been taken from a pepperol woman earlier. Littleton police officers Scott Corneau and Paul Barada said they had a they and a state trooper spotted. Did you say trooper? <laughs> she's she's doing her Boston accent right now. <laughs> Have you just noticed? I've been doing it the whole time. I, I was letting you. I was letting you roll with it. Yeah, I, I was waiting. Yeah. I was waiting trooper. to see. I was waiting to see when you guys were going to comment on it. I didn't realize she said trooper. Go ahead, Jen. Take it away. I was speaking my native tongue. Littleton police officers Scott Corneau and Paul Barada said they and a state trooper spotted LaPlante hiding in the crawl space beneath a large industrial dumpster outside the lumberyard. Yeah, I hear it now. You're not going to get out. We just told him you're, you're not going to get out. So he came out and he, he laid down on the floors first, said Barada. Okay. This kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, the manhunt after the uh, mar marathon bombing. Mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. that was an crazy watch when he was like laying down on the boat. Damn. For you uh, Southerners out there that didn't understand a word what she said, basically he runs, hides under this dumpster in the, in the lumber yard there in Ayer County. Now Littleton police officers, they track him down there and they tell him to get out and then he does. There you go. You all caught up now. Now they actually found him driving a van on Park Street. So here's what happens. Two days go by, and they're looking for this guy. Within 12 hours of the murder, they actually go to his mother's house and ask for him, you know, because they know, and they just want to question him. And then he basically runs out the back. So for two days, the intense manhunt is to trying to find this kid, the 17-year-old kid. The last day, he goes up, this random mother and her soccer mom duties, She's driving her yellow van, boot to boot to boo, and this guy comes up with a twenty two caliber pistol and hijacks it. He actually tries to hold her hostage at first, but then he's like, nah, fuck it, just get the shit out of here. I'm commandeering your van. Okay. Now like in the like in the movie. I'm the captain now. Before the murder even happened, everyone knew who it was in the town. Wow. Because for the past few months he's been breaking into multiple residences. Oh. And in fact, the gun that was used in the murder was a stolen pistol from one of the houses that he broke into. Wow. Okay, what you're reading now is oh. from UPI, which is the United Press International. This is a journalist-ran magazine dating back to 1907. On November 16, 1987, between 11.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m., someone broke into the Gustafsson home. Among other things, the thief took a cordless telephone, two cable television boxes, a cable television remote control device, and some coins from a Liberty Silver dollar collection. The defendant placed the Gustafsson's cordless telephone and cable box in his brother's tool cabinet. The defendant told his brother that he was putting them there to prevent his parents from seeing them. At that time, the brother's defendant's brother-in-law also saw the defendant with some silver coins, similar to those reported missing from the Gustafsson home, including a Statue of Liberty coin in a box. It's not neighbors like, you know, we have a neighbor to the right of us, neighbor to the left, but... It, you know, the wood lines in the back of your house. Yeah. So it's the neighbor that is across the wood line. Gotcha. Yeah. So he actually, they were pretty close in proximity. Like the back door neighbor. Yeah. I believe she said the back door neighbor. <laughs> John's refraining from making another joke about that. So good job, John. What? Oh, you thought I was going to make an anus joke? Yes. I wasn't even thinking about that. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I was not even thinking that. Give him another eight okay. seconds. Would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's all I can think about. I'm sure it is. <laughs> uh, when they went to those woods that separated the him and the Gustafsons, the police found a shirt, like a, a bloody shirt that had a pair of gloves wrapped in them, like, a, you know, the black leather gloves. But here's like, the thing. Like OJ? But here's the thing about the gloves. He's leaving his gloves and his shirt. Oh. The thing about these gloves is when the police that, you know, they unwrapped them from the shirt and they picked up, you know, the middle finger or whatever. Yeah. And bath water came out. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. This, he has never seen an episode yeah, of Dateline. This kid like, definitely didn't go to Boston College High. No. Also mm -hmm. inside the shirt rolled up was a family nameplate 
that said Gustafsons. It was actually taken as a trophy oh, from the victim's home. God. Now, let me talk about the murder weapon. It was a 22 caliber handgun. It, it, am I safe to assume that this uh, fella has a mm, perhaps low IQ? No, he sounds more like a burnout. Yeah, oh, yeah, like maybe oh, pothead or I something. I didn't even show you any pictures yet, did I? No. No. But he does not seem to be an intelligent young man. He's been called by one newspaper, quote, skinny teenager with bad skin. And I know these pictures don't really do it justice, but he's, he's got some face. really bad acne. Let, let me show you. Um, I do feel for people with really bad acne, you know? Like, you can't help it. He killed three people. Oh, yeah. I mean, aside from that. This is a good picture. He's like a giant about, in um, that photo. He's got bad skin. Yeah, he does have bad skin. That's is he, a, look is at that smirk. He a a um, drug addict. No, he's a No, teenager. he's not a drug addict. Oh, because he has like po- pock marks. Yeah, but he's 17. He's 17, yeah. Not to say that 17 year olds can't be drug addicts, but like, you know, you associate the acne with this age. Okay, let me see. Either. Could be either. What I'm reading. From, Combination skin. What I'm reading now is from the Commonwealth versus Daniel LaPlante. Quote, she died as a result, this is talking about Priscilla, she died as a result of two shots at close range with a twenty two caliber firearm. The shots were fired through a pillow which lay on top of the victim's head. I have a trivia question for you guys. Go ahead. You know how, so you said the Commonwealth, Massachusetts is a Commonwealth. What yeah. other state is part of the Commonwealth? Rhode Island. Vermont. False, both of you. It's Maine. I was closest. You were right wrong. There. Geographically. They found two shell casings in LaPlante's home that matched the gun. They also found a used condom in his home and a condom at the residence of the victim. There was also a lot of sperm literally everywhere. He was a teenager. How, well, how many times? No, I don't know if I want to know that answer. No. Never mind. Nope. Don't. Although I will say... A, what, how many times can you jack it? Yeah, a day. Like, as a teenager. 18? Ew. Is, is that, is is that is your my, record? Is my record? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, in all seriousness... So so Nequizzle, read this. This is from the Commonwealth versus Daniel LaPlante. There's a lot of luz here. Carolyn LeClaire, a chemist with the department... No, I gotta don't say it. Read <laughs> the, don't do the Boston accent. It's, it's gross. <laughs> yeah, gross. Carolyn LeClaire... A chemist with the Department of Public Safety. <laughs> it sounds uneducated. No, it doesn't. Sounds it, great. It does. No, it Actually, sounds... did you know the, the New England accent is the original like English British accent? accent? Yeah. yeah. Carolyn LeClaire, a chemist from the Department of Public Safety, found semen and sperm cells near one of the corner of the bedspread and a portion of a condom on the floor beside the bedspread. In the bedroom closet, LeClaire found a knotted brown sock dampened with saliva, consistent with having been used as a gag. She also found seven ligatures, a necktie, a sock, stockings, and pantyhose, which had been knotted and cut. In the bedroom, police found a nearly full bottle of beer that apparently had been taken from the Gustafsson refrigerator. In the kitchen waste basket, police found several pieces of paper which were torn from the pages of a pornographic magazine. All right, I got one thing to say that I didn't notice before. I saw in the newspaper that there was a condom found in his home as well as a crime scene. And oh. I was like, well, what did he use? Does he jerk two? off? In but his if you look at this, condom? I didn't notice this before, but it says a portion, the second line, and a portion of a condom. Huh. Oh. So I, what he probably did was rip it half of it and took one half for a souvenir. Oh, that's He's taking a lot it. of souvenirs. Because who would have a portion of a condom? You got to rip that shit in half to get a portion. That is not like. Oh. So that's the first time I noticed that. Um, and also, I, I've read like, through this before. Why would but you in, carry that around in your pocket? Well, it's a souvenir. You know, he's got the nameplate from the house, too. All and right, the yeah, shell casings. OK, so that's like an appropriate souvenir, but not the condom. Well, nothing is an appropriate souvenir. I'm but... just saying like if like, OK, like if you went to the zoo. Uh, so question. I mean, how is this guy? You already said that he's he. He maybe let it slip that he was like saying he didn't do it. There has never been more evidence in a crime yeah, scene no shit. <laughs> in a story that we've covered. He's yeah. got condoms, semen and sperm cells. He's got a beer bottle that would also have his saliva on it. He's taken several trophies. And like, the, what the, the fuck? And he's I a did, neighbor. Like what? What I didn't point out is the 
that I didn't go into is the search dogs actually went right to his house. <laughs> like, I mean, it sounds through like... the woods to his house. Like sat right by the porch. It was like, all right, that, he's probably in there. <laughs> but, uh, I'm assuming this is his. Fir- these are his first and only murders because yeah, they he clearly are. could not have done anything else. And and I, I want to say good. in 2017, I believe he requested basically an acquittal to get out of prison. So he may get out of prison because he was a minor at the time. I'm just just keep that in mind. Cause this story isn't crazy yet. This story is nowhere near where I'm about to take it. I'm about to take it to a different Seriously? level. Yeah, the story's crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I was like, oh, this is a, a you know, bada bing, bada boom type story. No, it ain't bada bing. It's the bottom. What the shit? I feel like I'm going to need a drink then. Before we move on, I want to say the gun was actually found by the husband on April 7th, 1988. So the next year. Where did he find it? He found it in the glove compartment of a Jeep Cherokee that they had like in the back that didn't work. You know, you had an old junker car that doesn't work. He was in the glove box wow. of that Jeep mm. Cherokee. Wow, that's weird. I mean, I'm assuming they would have had enough evidence to convict this guy without that. But Oh, yeah. And I'll get to that. But he was convicted of three life sentences. But that's not the... The weird thing about this case, we're about to go into what the weird thing is. So if you want to read this, this is from the Boston Globe. LaPlante's lawyer and the plant's relatives see not a monster, but a confused youth who is not capable of the brutality the authorities say LaPlante purpose- perpetrated after breaking into the Gustafsson home on Saunders Road Tuesday afternoon. I've known the kid for four or five years now. And I have as much fear of him as I do my maiden aunt, said attorney Robert F. Casey Jr. I can imagine he's going to be painted as an ogre. But with me, he's always come across as a quiet, reticent kid. The LaPlantes have lived in the community for 15 years. He lives with his mother, Elaine Moore, and his stepfather, several brothers and sisters. He was a troublemaker and everyone knew it. But I'm going to tell you, probably why that happened. One neighbor told reporters, quote, when you saw Danny, you watched him. He earned his reputation. He was a troublemaker from day one. He was also known as a loner in high school. One of his high school peers said this about Daniel LaPlante. The guy never really was all that friendly. He never liked to go to parties. He never really talked much. He was a C type of student, right? Made all C's, kind of stood in the background, C got you a degree. And he just was a loner. Spoken like a true counselor. One month before the murder, he... now For my kids, yeah. <laughs> Not saying I condone that, but, you know. I want to point out, this is going to make sense in a minute. One month before the murder, he was recently released from DYS. Do you all know what that is? No. Is Department it- of Youth mm-hmm. Services. Meaning the- he had a shitty childhood and he was... He yeah, was like DSS. Yeah. It- CPS. Department of Youth Services. Or it was other... basically like a um, uh, juvenile detention psychiatrist type of thing. He was diagnosed with both hyperactive disorder and dyslexia. This is from the Commonwealth versus Daniel LaPlante. Court papers say LaPlante was subjected to extreme psychological abuse by his father, sexually abused by a psychiatrist, and struggled with dyslexia and hyperactivity disorder. So growing up, he was abused by his father every day, physical, sexually abused, mentally abused. They put him in counseling and then his psychiatrist started to sexually abuse him as well. So not a very good start in life. This is the late 80s. We're still in the satanic panic. So I thought it'd be interesting to throw this in there. This is also about the story, but... When Daniel LaPlante said he was innocent, he didn't do it. His excuse was he was sitting at home watching the spawn of Satan, Satan's mistress, Satan's hoe, otherwise known as MTV. (laughs) Police view music videos for clues to triple murder. Townsend Mass. Investigators studied music videos yesterday to determine if the productions had any influence on a teenager who allegedly killed a nursery school teacher and her two children. Police also viewed several films recorded on video cassettes, but declined to disclose their nature or titles. 
Lane said investigators watched the films for clues of ritualistic violence, similar to evidence found at the scene of the Gustafsson killings. We're covering every angle, not letting anything go by the wayside. We want to check out every aspect of the case, he said. We're watching movies to see if we can come up with any similarities, Lane said. We're looking for a motive to understand why he would do such a thing. I forgot that MTV was such like a... Oh, yeah. A big... It was like... TRL! You know, they actually put out a show that I kind of want to see. It's TRL. Episodes Total, Total Request, Request Live. Live. Oh, of course, yeah. Daily. I, they put out a new show that I kind of want to watch. It's like, how far is tattoo far? And like, these couples like get tattoos they put ta- they make tattoos for each other oh i think i've seen an episode of this i kind of want to watch it and i don't know where they, to like, find it pick each other pick out each other's tattoos or something like yeah, that yeah but they're really bad tattoos Ooh. you know what show that i really love on mtv what i don't know if this is on mtv or not but it's called catfish yes that i think it so is that's, that's mtv okay so catfish explain that show it's about people who have fake identities online and make them make someone else fall in love with them. Like, and they have pictures of find other pictures of this person online. Well, so that's that, what a catfish is. Yes. Yes. So you're telling me if Daniel the plant tells a 16 year old on the telephone that she's never seen him, that quote, he's popular, well educated, extremely good looking, and the captain of his football team, you think that'd be catfishing? Yes. I mean, extremely good looking is kind of a subjective term. So I'm like really, really, really ridiculously ridic- good looking. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. This is before the murder. We're going back not even one year. This is 1986. We're talking about Annie and Jessica Andrews. I'm pulling this part of the story from a reporter named Jeffrey Higgins. He works for Neshoba Publications, and they did a documentary on on IDTV for this. Whoa. This um, information is not available in newspapers because the victims here were too young. A lot of the newspapers hint at this, but this guy, this reporter actually interviewed the family and everything. So he had the full story. So um, that's where I'm pulling this from. If you guys want to know, here we go. Annie and Jessica Andrews. They're the same age as LaPlante right now. In 1986. No, no, no. They're not twins, but LaPlante is 16 at the time. This is 1986. Annie Andrews is also 16. She has a younger sister. I think the younger sister was 13 at the time. They meet Danny, but not in person. They actually go to separate schools. The number was given to her. His phone number was given to her or vice versa by a friend. And then they communicated that way for the first time. So they've never seen each other before. This is where the case gets extremely weird they go to different schools and the whole time they're talking i mean they're talking for months and they haven't even seen each other Mm -hmm. which is kind of weird because they live so close together Mm -hmm. he's telling her stuff like i'm the captain of the football team i'm super popular you know i get laid all the time all this stuff making himself out to be some sort of stud muffin john tucker must die some yes. sort of yes. Yeah. He's making himself out to be some sort of John Tucker. And you and I both know that the only reason why you watch that movie is because of yeah. Sophia Bush. <laughs> yeah, that's my baby girl. In in fiction world, that's weird that she's also not ranked higher than Flo from Progressive. <laughs> <laughs> Flo is just fucking sexy, dude. Plus, you can save me a shit ton of money on my car insurance. <laughs> also, you have Geico. I have progressive. I'm cheating on Flo. I have USAA. Uh, I'm sorry, Flo. I hope you don't listen to this. <laughs> what if she does listen to this? That'd be crazy. Oh, my God. Flo. Uh, Flo. Tell us. Isn't Flo no longer the spokesperson for she, progressive? She like, makes very, very few appearances now. Yeah, yeah, I think she's winding down. Annie and Jessica Andrews. Now, they're not both hitting on this guy. Jessica's the younger sister and is like, I wonder if he's so cute. Oh, my God. He sounds so cute. But there's he says no, he gets laid all the time. I no bet by cheerleaders. They're so bubbly. You know, they're saying all this stuff. And Annie's all hyped up. How are they sending? There's it's, no cell no, phones. No, it's just telephone calls. There's no. It's not like send me a picture of your right. 17-year-old the, wiener. Yeah. Gross. Okay, I'll cut that. Annie and Jessica Andrews, the sisters, they're calling this guy. Jessica's like, oh, my God, he sounds so hot. 
you know, oh my God, he's a football player. So they were getting really worked up about this guy. So finally, after a few months, he asked the question, hey, will you go get some ice cream with me? So here's what happens. He shows up to the door dressed as a catfish. Wait, that's not how that show works, right? He shows up as a catfish. (laughs) He shows up. Can you imagine like the fence flipping around? (laughs) He shows up at the door. He's not the popular football star. I mean, you saw him. Real bad skin. So is he is he like is he just pretending like he's all the other things? Yeah, he just has a pizza face. He's a L O Z E R. A loser. A loser. Yeah. (laughs) The catfish shows up at the house all floppity doppity. They actually do go out. Now she's really disappointed because he's supposed to be some hunk, you know, some um. What's that John guy? Tucker. Thor. No. Oh, Chris Hemsworth. Chris, Ugh. why'd you say it like that? What the fuck? Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, no, right? Yeah. He's supposed to be some Chris Hemsworth with his fucking eight pack in that movie. Like, what the shit? Which you should watch the Marvel Universe. I know you don't like it, but you should watch it. Go ahead. And, you know, he shows up as fucking McLovin. <laughs> <laughs> Even though Annie was really disappointed, she still went out with him to get ice cream, but then she left. You know, she's like, I got to go home. This isn't kind of working. And that's the last that she thought that she would ever see of this guy, Danny, right? I also need to point out around this time, both Annie and Jessica, their mother had just passed away from cancer. Oh. Just recently passed. And they are both grieving. Now, even though she's going out with this guy, she's still in the grieving process. She leaves and goes back home and doesn't think anything anything else about it that's the last time i'm gonna see this guy never again you know it didn't work out you know he was a nice guy but it just wasn't my type yada 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 let's go our separate ways since the sisters are grieving their mother they decide to try to communicate with her through a ouija board now the 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 father doesn't know yet. The father, a single father now, he's actually a bus driver. He's working overtime as it is to support his two daughters. They actually hold a seance and try to talk to their dead mother. And it works. Using the Ouija board? Using the Ouija board. Those things are fucked. You don't fuck with that shit. Agreed. I mean, I like. I feel like every time you play with a Ouija board, somebody is actually moving it. But, you know, don't disturb it. I've never actually had my hand on a Ouija board because I don't fuck with ghosts. We should get one. No, absolutely Why? not. Why? They because, tell me fucking Toys R Us. How bad can they be? Well, Toys R Us are closed exactly. now, number one. Number two, once you use a Ouija board, you open the portal to the undead. Oh, my Lord. Here we go. I mean, every time I've ever played, quote unquote, played on a Ouija board, somebody has been very always clearly moving the thing. So I don't really believe in them, but... I don't encourage if there is supernatural experiences to fuck with me. Okay, Nicole. So here's my challenge to you. So you get a Ouija board and you play with it outside of the house. You can go in the middle of the street or once in the neighbor's yard, but not inside our house. And you can play with it and have your hands on it by yourself and not move it. And you tell me. It won't move. I guarantee you it won't move. Have you tried? Yes. It won't move. I have tried. When I was younger, like being like, oh, you you move it like it, it is. It you doesn't know why move it doesn't itself. move? Because fucking physics. It doesn't move. And something doesn't just move unless something pushes it. Well, <laughs> what the fuck? Well, <laughs> as someone who has been affected by paranormal activity oh, multiple times God. in their life, here we go. I am not about to fuck with a Ouija board. We all know Patrick Swayze comes in your room every night and fondles <laughs> you. You know, you <laughs> wish you were fondled by Patrick Swayze. Y'all, y'all do the clay together. All right, so. They do a seance and it works. It works. Y'all didn't hear that? It works. It works. They actually get a response from the mother. The response comes from tapping on the wall. The bump, 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 bump. Now they're freaking the shit out because they think it's the mother. Now this goes on for several months. Several, several months this goes on. Not only the tapping on the wall, but turning light switches on and off. You know, the TV cuts on, cuts off. And this is, of course, when the dad's not home. For months, there was tapping on the wall, just supernatural stuff. And they would tell the dad about it, but he didn't believe it because, you know, and the police were called several times, but they they are grieving and people handle things differently. It gets so bad that the sisters start noticing writing on the mirror. 
The mirror says, like, I'm in your bedroom waiting for you. Kind of like that Scream movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or I know what you did last summer. The police get there and they see it's just tomato ketchup. So the father thinks it's the daughters. And they're like, it's not me, dad. I promise, you know, there's something really here. This goes on for months and the father does not believe both the daughters. Until one time when there was another writing on the mirror and a lot of shit was going on. Things were banging around everywhere, lights going on and off, all kinds of shit. The father comes home and it's like, I'm putting an end to this right now. I'm approved. You know, you guys are doing this and making this up. So he goes upstairs and he kind of gets this weird feeling. Something may be in this house, like a demon or something. Mm -hmm. And he walks into his own bedroom. He walks in the door and he's like, huh? Because standing right at the bed, turned around so he can't see, is what he thinks is his wife. (gasps) What the fuck? She's wearing the wedding dress that was hanging up in the closet. Uh Uh-uh. And she's just standing there. And the dad's like, oh, my God, what, what is this? So she slowly turns her head around. And then he sees her face. And it's Daniel LaPlante. What? Wearing his wife's wedding dress with Indian Uh, war paint on his face, wielding a hatchet. What the fuck is wrong with this kid? Jeffrey Higgins, a reporter that covered this case, said it best when he said, quote, The father was confronted by a boy wielding an axe while wearing his wife's dress and brandishing war paint. So this is before he was taken into custody for the murder? Yeah, this is before. This is uh, about eight months before. this. He hasn't murdered anyone since then. This is why, if you remember when I said when he murdered that family, he's been out of the mental institution for about a month. So he just got out for doing this crime. Now, he did get arrested right after this. And it turns out all those bumps and all those lights switching on and off and everything else... He was actually living in the walls of the sisters. How can you live in the walls? Like, what the fuck? I mean, aren't they not even wide enough for a human to live in? Are they only for, like, rats and stuff? Where did he, like, get in? Like, how did he get access to the walls? Did he, like, shower? Did he... How did he eat? Like, was he raiding their stuff? Like... Yeah, he was raiding their stuff. He didn't eat it. I mean, he didn't shower at all. Ooh, well, that's gross. I would, I would imagine then you would smell something, as rancid as someone not showering. Yeah, it would probably smell like a rat died in that wall. Unless he was skipping school and showered during the day. Ooh, maybe. The Pepperell Police Department secretary Kathy Plummer says, "Quote: He was hiding in the closet when they came home, and he chased them into their bedroom with a hatchet." The guy was swinging a hatchet and he had his face all painted up. Like what made him what made him do that? Was he obsessed with the girls? Yeah, he like, was obsessed was with them. Was he did he get rejected, he got rejected on their game? Yeah. Like like shit, like that's not okay to do that, you know? You need to you need well, to he's find got fucking some... the mental problems. He's been I molested does. by so what makes that him he safe is for disturbed. society now. Huh? What would make him safe for society now then? Like, I'm sorry, but there's nothing that that I think would make him say, like, oh, yep, this guy's cool to be out and about. Kill like, three he, people, had, he, had, he had to stay in Bridgewater Hospital, right? He had to stay there. And then, you know, he leaves and then he comes out and then he commits a triple homicide. Well, whose fault is Quadruple that? Quadruple co- homicide. How about homicide. It's the state's fault? Why? But it's his fault. Because they fucking let him out. This guy okay. like, lived in someone's fucking walls I for three don't months. Disagree so, with so you're, that. So, Pretending so, to be the dead mother that died of cancer. So it would be the state's fault again if he was released from prison <laughs> and then he goes and commits another murder. I know, but he wouldn't have committed the murder in the fucking first place yes. if they didn't just fucking release him. I 100% agree okay, with that. Okay, it's the fucking state's fault. It's it's the state's fault for mm. releasing him. It's his fault for committing yeah. the crime. Yeah. It's not. I don't think it's fully his fault. He's fucked up in the head. Yes. Not to the point where you murder someone. He was 16 at the time, and he gets charged with armed assault in a dwelling, breaking and entering, malicious injury to a property, and armed burglary. He goes to the Bridgewater Hospital, where then he was released 
to commit these three murders a few months after he was wow. released. Fun fact. Wow. Fun fact that that hospital is closed now. Like the mental the mental hospital oh, really? wow. is closed. Also, the Taunton, mental, Taunton State Mental Hospital is closed, too. At the trial, he pleads innocent to all the murder charges, and he was actually sentenced to life in prison for each one. He did say he feels sorry about the the murders. He says, quote, I murdered three innocent people. I do not have words to fully express my profound sorrow, but I am truly sorry for the harm that I have caused. But on the same token, between when he was sentenced in 2014, now he says he's changed since then, but he did convert to Wiccanism while he was in the uh, the prison. I mean, he's still in the prison serving his time. Between 1988 and 2014, he actually sued the prison. This is from the International Business Times, March 15th, 2013. He sues the prison because they will not offer him dragon blood. And that's oh, what he needs on. for his that's what he needs for his Wiccan ceremonies. I'm sorry. Where are you supposed to get dragon blood from? Well, dragon blood isn't of a dragon. It sounds like it is, but it's actually a, a natural concoction of a couple of different herbs. If you look up dragon's blood, you'll see that it's actually a natural remedy. Oh. Dragon's blood is a bright red resin, which is obtained from different species of a number of distinct plant genres. Okay, so there's a bunch of different plants. But it's kind of interesting because he needs dragon blood to do his Wiccan ceremonies and he needs a couple other stuff that they would not provide for him. So he's he's essentially alleging that they're discriminating against his religion. Yeah, exactly. Now, he tried to sue him many times. He he never won from what I can found. But that was from 1988 to 2014. And I'll show you what he looks like now. Since then, since 2014, he seems really remorseful and the family has accepted his apology wow. and forgiven him. And he's trying to get out of prison right now because he was a minor at the time of all this. Now he's not serving time for the, the being in the walls and being a fucking creep. He's serving time for the three murders, but that's him now. Wow. And he says he's changed and everything, but you know, who knows? A lot of people think he's just lying and he's just trying to get out. I mean, I get that people can change and I get that he was a minor. I'm sorry, but no, I'm not sorry. No. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button on whatever podcasting app you use. If you like this story, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're absolutely obsessed with this podcast and want to become our stalker, go to talkmer.com slash join. Become a Talko Supremo. Get a badass t-shirt, sticker, swag, a lot of love. Shout it out all over the place. Tell me what story you want me to do. I'll research it, dedicate it to you on the Talk Murder Me podcast. My name is John. Here with Jen and Nicole. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people. Yeah, and you know what? We kind of went away from being okay. Under British I will rule. speak. Yeah, but guess what? Now, now you got so, some you know of what? the loads both accents. So what are you gonna do? Screw you. Well, what's Lisa, so? What's the rating? Go ahead, <gasps> read this. Don't even. Don't <laughs> even. Uh, you know we are supposed to get married in less than two months, <laughs> pending coronavirus. <gasps> Excuse Everyone's me. Dying out there. What the fuck? They're not dying. We're gonna have zombie show if, to the fucking. If we, yeah, the day is not about you, Jen. But other than that, uh, hopefully the, the day happens. Not about you, Jen. It's about me. What the fuck? This is true. It is about you, John. It's not like send me a D pick or a V pick. Who sends V pics? Vagina pic. Yeah, I know. Who sends that? You'd be surprised. What the you fuck? You send B pics. Everyone's B pics? Butthole pics? Oh. pics. <laughs> no. Send what kind of guys? Girl number one. Uh, girls. <laughs> girls. Don't do it, ladies. I hope that none of my students listen to this, right? Obviously. Girls do it. But That's it, the best otherwise, way. you're about to give them the best advice but ever. But if you are, I can't control it. So, like, just don't send pictures. That's do it. Let them keep them wanting. I remember when we first started dating, John asked for a picture, but he wasn't asked. Like, I asked for the butthole picture. No, I don't know if you were like <laughs> asking. Right the bat. I don't know if you were asking for like a sexy picture, but you sent me one of like, you know, you at the gym and you're like, send me, <laughs> send me a picture. This is like week two of us knowing each other. And I was like, no, I don't do that. I was like, like send, yeah, but sexual pictures of yourself that could go everywhere. If I buy this car off eBay from Seattle 
They need to send me pictures. Okay, no. Yes, before I buy it. Nay, nay, nay. <laughs> nay, nay, nay. So the, the mm-hmm. bottom line is, girls, snappity snap. No, the bottom line is, I prefer to use the term spiritual, but not religious, okay? Spiritual, <laughs> not religious. <laughs> You're going to hell, Nicole. So are you. Well, fuck that. Hell yeah. <laughs>